Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today we are back looking at the suggestions passed to developers in August 2020, and I thought on this fine Sunday we would have a look at the ground vehicles which were passed, because there's a little bit of everything here, and that is always nice to see. So, let's get started with the first one. This is from Pablo Sniper, and Pablo Sniper is talking about a vehicle that I've advocated for a lot and would love to see it at some point. This is the T-37 light tanks, and colloquially known as the missing link between stuff like the Chaffee and then eventually the Bulldog. So, what is this machine? Well, the story starts at the end of World War II. Now, if you didn't know, at the end of World War II, what's the United United States did was terminate all of its tank production. The only exceptions uh, were a few experimental vehicles, and therefore the production run of the light tank, the Chaffee, or the M24, ended in August 1945, after the completion of nearly 5,000 vehicles, and uh, they were destined to serve in the United States Army until the Korean War, but prior to the end of World War II, there was a lot of consideration to actually improving the Chaffee, making a better version of it, making a better light tank, and therefore they decided to start building stuff. So the proposed light tank was to be about 25 tons in weight, increased firepower and mobility compared to the Chaffee, and since the latter was considered to be deficient in firepower, they weren't happy with the 75mm that was on the M24. It was also going to be armed with a gun approximately 3 inches in calibre, capable of penetrating 5 inches of homogeneous uh, steel armour at 30 degrees at a range of 1,000 yards. And the design of a light tank to meet the requirements um, of the Stillwell board, who was the board behind the project, um, actually was initiated by the Research and Development Division at Detroit Arsenal during July of 1946. There was meetings between the board and all also uh, Detroit's Arsenal, and uh, they decided on the 27th of September 1946, which is item 31059 of the Ordnance Committee Minutes, designated the new vehicle as the Light Tank T-37, and recommended the manufacture of three pilot tanks, so basically three prototype tanks at that point. This was later reduced to two, and then by early 1949, the design of the T-37 was complete, They'd created a wooden mock-up, and the drawings released for production of the two pilot tanks, and the new vehicle was manned by a crew of four, uh, with the commander, gunner, and loader in the turret, and of course the driver located in the left front hull. There was a bunch of periscopes put on it, and also areas for main armament ammunition, and the T-37 was powered by the AOS 8951 gasoline engine, uh, manufactured by Continental Motors as part of a new family of engines for military vehicles, and as its, designated, uh, as its designation indicated, it was a six-cylinder power plant, it was air-cooled with an opposed um, configuration and supercharged. With a displacement of approximately 895 cubic inches, it developed 500 gross horsepower uh, at 2800 RPM. And this engine had many components uh, in common with the more powerful members of the same family, such as the 12-cylinder AV-1790, which was intended for the medium tank. So yeah, this vehicle had a pretty beefy engine. It didn't really have a ton of armor on it, but it was armed with the 76mm T-94 gun, had over 137mm uh, pen at the, desired, uh, at the desired distances it required, and it had negative 9 and plus 20 elevation. So yeah, uh, the upper front plate of it was only 25mm, the lower front plate was 32, and the whole sides uh, were 19 to 25, with the turret front being 32. So this vehicle did not have, you know, a ton of armor on it, but it didn't need it. It was supposed to be a light tank, and as I said, kind of, uh, I suppose, it is the missing link between stuff uh, such as, you know, the uh, Bulldog and the Chaffee, but there are a few more uh, versions of, let's call them, prototype Bulldogs before we get into that. Still, a cool pick. Uh, for this. The next one is from uh, a wonderful person, once again, Pablo Sniper, and what Pablo Sniper is bringing in is the VK3002. Now, if you don't know what the VK3002 is, 
it looks very, very similar to a panther, doesn't it? And that's because it basically is. Uh, <laughs> what the 3002 is was an expansion of the panther design, but they changed one key factor. They removed a ton of armor from it. So see, this is kind of a light panther. The muzzle brake is similar uh, to the one used on the Panzer IV F2 as well, and the commander's cupola is slightly changed, uh, even though it is, uh, you know, e even though it's incredibly similar. But basically, what the major difference between this and the panthers we have in game is, is the upper glacis uh, of this machine so the upper front hull. Um, the normal Panther D has 80 millimeters of armor, where this, the 3002M, has 60 millimeters. And then the turret front, uh, when it comes to the normal Panther, has 100 millimeters, and this vehicle has 80 millimeters. So this vehicle, the only major difference, or the one that you will find in-game uh, compared to others is the fact that it would have a lot less armor on it. It was also just kind of a one-off prototype and uh, unfortunately didn't really make any of the rounds. Uh, they just stuck with the standard panther design. So yeah, just a light panther is the way to look at it. The next one is from Tasty95215 and we're talking about a big bruiser. You may recognize this tank. It is not the Type 90, though, uh, which is probably what you're thinking. This is the TKX0005. This is a prototype of the Type 90, which was built uh, during the late 80s. Now, there was a bunch of uh, prototypes of the uh, Type 90, all designed for different ideas, changing slightly different things. And the TKX0005 was the fifth prototype of the Japanese Type Type 90 MBT. What is interesting about this vehicle though is this is probably the one which would be the weirdest to fit into game and the reason for this is because of the stuff that it's actually missing. So this vehicle is missing a lot of features. The first one uh, that it's uh, missing, even though it looks like, you know, your average uh, Type 90, is it's missing a lot of its optics, um, and they just don't exist on the vehicle anymore. It is actually able to be seen. Uh, it still exists uh, in the world, so yeah, you can go and have a look at it. But basically, it's very hard to tell if this vehicle has, uh, whether it had night vision or not. Um, at least uh, what we do know is that the gunner doesn't have night vision so the gunner doesn't have night vision or thermals in this machine and uh, because they're just not present on the top of the turrets like the actual uh, the actual gunner site doesn't exist for this vehicle so technically the gunner is not able to really see <laughs> from this vehicle do you see what I mean about trying to fit it into the game would be a little bit weird the gunner site at the time 90 uh, actually contains a periscope laser rangefinder and also thermal sites for the gunner none of these exist for this version of the prototype so you would have no laser rangefinder you'd have no thermal sights and you wouldn't technically even be able to see as the gunner uh, through any of the optics uh, so yeah what a what, what a wonderful position you would be in as a gunner uh, but the TKX005 could have access, we don't know this, but could have access to night vision for the driver and the commander as earlier vehicles such as a Type 61 and Type 74 did also use these. Uh, so you'd have a blind gunner, but at least everybody else would be able to see. The major differences between something like the TKX0005 uh, would be, and the Type 90, would be stuff like the ammunition choices. The Type 90 would is able to fire the DM33, whereas the TKX0005 uh, the, would not have access to DM33 because it was completed after the DM33 uh, uh, went into service, uh, so therefore you probably have access to DM-13, DM-23, and DM-12, obviously the APFS-DS rounds and the HEAT-FS. The other thing as well is it doesn't have the Browning machine gun on it, uh, so therefore it uh, would not have uh, access to, I suppose, an anti-aircraft gun, and it would also have no smoke grenades. Uh, so this would be a very much bare-bones down Type 90. Wouldn't have access to sights, wouldn't have access to smoke grenades, wouldn't have access to exterior guns. And then on top of this as well, this one's a bit unconfirmed. 
but it's probably true too. Uh, that's the thing. The problem with talking about these vehicles is it's kind of hard to, you know, work out um, work out exactly what is going on since all of this stuff is still very much classified. Uh, the TKX005 may not have had blowout panels. Uh, so whereas the one in game we have, the Type 90, has blowout panels, this vehicle should not, um, or might not, uh, is probably the best way to say it. There is a bunch of visual differences as well between the type 90 and this so uh, it has a tow hook on the rear of the tank slightly different side skirt design as well uh, which is kind of nice it also has a smaller basket hanging off the back of the turret has no storage box on the side of the turret and shorter wind sensor on the rear of the turret so as i said this vehicle is a type 90 if you took off all of his external stuff basically is the way to look at it it's a naked type 90. The next vehicle we're having a look at is the WZ122, and this is brought to us by uh, Overlord. And the WZ122, it was an MBT which was developed by the PLA, or the People's Republic of China, and it was developed, uh, its development started in 19, March of 1970. They built a bunch of prototypes, but then unfortunately it never really made it. And the reason for this, well, we'll get into. There was quite uh, some important things going on in the mid-20th century for China, and unfortunately this tank got caught up in it. So the WZ-122 was supposed to be a new vehicle after stuff like the WZ-121, which eventually became the Type 69, and obviously the Type 59. It was going to have a brand new chassis, which would be similar in design uh, to stuff like the Soviet and Chinese tanks at the time. The driver sat at the forward left of the hull, and the commander loader and gunner in the dome turret so they still were stuck on manual loading uh, didn't go auto loading yet it was going to have or had a multi-fuel engine uh, which was mounted traversely at the rear a new fire control system incorporating a collimator day night vision and also a laser rangefinder with a two-way stabilizer and a ballistic computer was going to be integrated with a 122 millimeter smoothbore gun to combat any future conflict against more, more powerful tanks with a higher first shot hit rate so they went for the big boomer instead of the uh, instead of the rate of fire here and then it would also have a pair of twin infrared guns guided anti-tank missiles which were mounted on either side of the turret uh, to further increase the firepower of the tank so just in case the gun wasn't good enough what was coming through would be anti-tank missiles it also had some mbc protection uh, on the tank and also better sound dampeners to improve crew comfort and in 1970 the first prototype of the wz122 was produced it had a 690 horsepower power plant and featured an innovative adjustable hydropneumatic suspension which was designed to improve ride comfort and gun stability over rough terrain and high speed. This is uh, different to a bunch of other hydropneumatic systems though as um, it would be able to adjust its suspension and vary the ride not only to the height but also the altitude and the pitch of the tank as well which would be similar to that of the S tank or the Type 74. It worked on one axis though and not three, uh, so it could raise or lower its profile, but it couldn't tilt or adjust. So it could just go up and down basically on the vertical level, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so the problem was the, the engineers who worked on this, they didn't really, this was like their first foray into hydropneumatic suspension, so they couldn't get it completely right, but you know, it still worked pretty well. The version of the WZ-122, which was produced in 1971 uh, it's uh, reverted many of the advanced features of the first prototype and uh, to that of components and parts Chinese engineers were well experienced with so just uh, streamline the process of production engine power was reduced to 641 horsepower and was tested between 1971 and 1973 and it actually didn't do too badly you know the problem was uh, the WZ-122 was uh, developed during the Chinese Cultural Revolution and a lot of the engineers which worked on the project was found as enemies of the state and executed. Yes, uh, so this tank wasn't fully produced basically because of the fact 
that a bunch of the engineers who worked on it were found as enemies of the state and couldn't finish the project. Uh, so, with the lack of experience and technology beyond China's industrial technological capabilities during the 70s, the 122 was just abandoned, which is really, really sad. Incredibly sad, because this thing has so many interesting things to it. You know, four infrared-guided anti-tank missiles, it has two 12.7mm anti-aircraft guns, has a 7.62 coaxial machine gun, has obviously the 122mm smoothbore, like, all of these things are awesome, and it just got stuck in an unfortunate situation, which we see way too often when it comes to tanks. So, the next vehicle is the Leopard Bofors 47. This is from Nicholas Konku, and this is what the vehicle looks like. Kind of an abomination, right? Well, welcome to Italy. So, when it comes to this vehicle in the 1960s, Italy wanted to uh, bolster its anti-air defense. The idea was is they already had the Sedan 25. They were very happy with the Sedan 25, but they wanted a vehicle to run alongside us, which would increase the chances of shooting down air targets and and provide some anti-aircraft -air coverage to armored columns uh, if they were needed. So something which was mobile, something which was able to move around, and something which would be kind of useful. So what they did is they had a bunch of uh, Leopard 1 uh, chassis, which were basically just around the place uh, from before. So they took those and, well, they took one of them, I should say, and they mounted the Bofors 4070 on it. Now, if you don't know what the Bofors 4070 is, do you know the Freccia, that new Italian boat that just got added to the game with the rapid fire 40 millimeter? That's the 4070. So you can imagine the amount of firepower that something like this would be able to put out. So yeah, it uh, generally would be something which could really rack out the uh, shots. It could also fire um, basically for the game HET, APCT, and also PT, uh, obviously practice tracer, stuff like that. But the problem was with the machine when they actually tested it, they didn't give it any night vision devices, they didn't give it any radar guidance systems, and when it actually came down to shooting air targets, it was a hell of a lot worse than the Saddam every time. So basically the Italians just looked at it and went, why don't we just use the Saddams? Why, why do we need this vehicle which is not really providing anything? We'll just make more Saddams. So yeah, uh, the only real upside of this vehicle is that it would have been really easy to produce because they had a ton of old leopard hulls so they could just put, you know, the license built both as ammunition and parts on top of it and how's your father? But the problem is, is it wasn't very combat effective compared to what they already have. So what, what would be the point, you know? So yeah, um, a cool vehicle. I think it would end up being more of a tank killer than anything else in War Thunder, but it would be kind of interesting. The next vehicle is from Edvold, or Edwald, and this is the AMX-10 Acra. It is box time again, boys. The AMX-10 Acra, and this, this post was actually made in 2018, and I just want to point that out, because this is before the other Acra we have, the AMX-30 uh, Acra, was actually added to the game. So, yeah, it was before the Leclerc, it was before the AMX-32, it was before the AMX-40. Um, good old uh, Edvold was wanting this vehicle, you know, as, uh, as early as that, you know, in 2018. 18 January of that year. So what this vehicle is, is it's a box uh, which is designed to carry the 142mm gun which fired the anti-tank missile which you should be familiar with with the AMX-30 Acra. Um, the study began in 1966, the first prototype was de delivered in 1970 and then there were two other prototypes which were built in 1971 and the prototype of the AMX-10 uh, obviously had the 142mm a missile gun on it and it could fire the Acra missile uh, with a range of 3,500 meters uh, and uh, also it could fire HE and heat shells from the 142 millimeter as well. It also had mounted a 20 millimeter on top of the box uh, so therefore it would be able to deal with some other stuff. This was an incredibly small vehicle by the way. It was six meters in length 
uh, width and height was about 2.8 meters and it was around about 15 tons uh, for the whole vehicle uh, supposedly it could go 65 kilometers an hour on road and uh, which and it also had enough fuel to be able to last 600 kilometers uh, so this vehicle uh, is actually still around uh, which is kind of cool it's actually in a museum in France uh, but yeah it's a box with a 142 uh, simple as that would be hilarious sometimes would be heartbreaking others in the game the next article is from wise minerva and wise minerva is talking about the panzerbill m41 this little beauty right here the good old armored car now this is in reference uh, to the vehicle uh, from Ireland, uh, well not from Ireland but Ireland was involved. In 1935 basically what happened was uh, Ireland as the country had ordered a Landsverk L60 to help bolster their armoured car division and it only at the time had one medium Mark D and uh, they wanted a second one arriving the following year as well. The Irish had been greatly impressed by the light tanks and as a result ordered two L-180 armoured cars in 1937 and a further six were ordered and delivered in 1939 with an order placed for five more. But with the outbreak of World War II, the order was cancelled by Sweden, uh, the remaining five armoured cars were placed in their own inventory, and the cars were well liked by its crew, and it was generally seen as having no issues with its engines and transmission, but had a bit of an issue with getting spare parts for the machines, with only five of them built. So the problem was especially seen in regards to the hard rubber tyres, you can actually see them in the picture, it's a pretty cool, interesting uh, design. And uh, these became a scarce commodity, especially since rubber was used for so many things in the Second World War. The main difference between the Panzerbill M41 and also the ML, sorry, the L180 is that the M41 had a turret with the M40 mounted on the L180. The main armaments for this machine was a 20 millimeter Bofors cannon, uh, and uh, it was a pretty good weapon, um, but it had a habit of uh, jumping when firing which is obviously uh, kind of bad. It also had an open 28 round magazine. It could pen around 25 millimeters of armor at around about 500 meters. Uh, this machine as well had two secondaries. It had two 8 millimeter guns and it was powered by the Bussing NAG L8V V8 cylinder petrol, 180 horsepower, uh, while also being uh, nearly 8,000 kilos in weight. The armor Armor itself, 9 millimeters all around, which is always great. So yeah, those are the suggestions past the developers uh, for the month of August 2020. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. I'd just like to thank Trigger Hippie, Universe, Conte Baraka, Eel of Goat, Eugene's Terry, Ambrosius McClellan, Daniel Stanton, Martinez, B. Young, Hans, and Samuel Slick for supporting the channel.